So good morning or good afternoon or good evening wherever you are in the world. Uh, Talent Finders would like to welcome entrepreneur, founder, CEO um, at Red Rock Global, FBI, uh, supervisory, special agent, um, RET, global investigations, Greg Barkin. So welcome, Greg. Thank you very much, Karen, for having me. So, Brig, uh, I'd like to congratulate you on all your achievements. Can you share with us how your uh, career started and what made you get into this brave field of service? Well, Karen, I have to say it was good old mom. Uh, I was finishing up five years as a, an Army officer and uh, living in Italy, and my mom happened to send me a newspaper clipping uh, that the FBI was looking for new agent candidates. So it all came through a newspaper clipping for me. But I have to say that um, really that was coupled with um, uh, some time as a, a campus police dispatcher. I was doing graveyard shifts back in college, and I was reading through these fascinating stories about FBI most wanted and fugitives and some of that true crime uh, stuff that that you know makes for great TV shows. So. Um, so I think that helped as well, kind of bolster my interest. But I mean, in the end, good or bad, I've always been a, an advocate for justice, small or large issues. So um, I think it was really kind of the uh, mixture of my mom sent me this clipping, and then I was also drawn into this field at the same time. Amazing. So during your time as an FBI agent, um, you worked on both criminal and terrorism matters both of which are highly intense and very dangerous. So how was that, ex also, how was that experience um, for you? And how did you mentally prepare yourself for these tasks? Well, I, you know, I, I, like you said, I worked both criminal and then eventually ended up in the terrorism realm. Um, you know, starting out as a new agent, you know, on the criminal side, I, I loved every minute of it. You know, I was, in the streets of Los Angeles, you know, working bank robberies, kidnappings, fugitives, all those things. We'd meet, you know, uh, as a small team in a parking lot, you know, gathered around the back of a car uh, with a pile of warrants for, you know, murderers, kidnappers, uh, and just kind of all around dark people. And uh, we'd then just roam through the day around Los Angeles, hunting them down to arrest them and put them in prison. Uh, so, it got very real very quickly for me out, out of the FBI Academy. I mean, we had uh, an opportunity to work a top 10 fugitive, you know, right out of the chute. Um, I mean, I remember distinctly, you know, working uh, the first murder that we arrested uh, as a team. And he was in my face chanting 187, which is the penal code for homicide. And so as a new agent, you know, I, I, again, I just, I, I, I ate this up. I enjoyed it. Um, I remember vividly working uh, a serial killer out of Canada. Uh, he was a hitman, actually, and, and he wow. would dress up. Yeah, he would dress up in black SWAT gear. He would go out. He would uh, kill the victim and then just throw the rifle on him and walk away. So, uh, you know, all these things were very exciting in, in the criminal realm. Um, and then eventually I moved into the terrorism uh, side. I know that we'll talk more about that. Yes. So um, some of your missions or assignments were solitary. Can you share with us more about those experiences and what were some of the challenges you were faced with and the risks um, and how did you adapt and what were the conditions like in those environments? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, Karen. I, you know, coming from the military uh, and from some deployments to include one down to Northern Iraq, um, you know, we would travel with, you know, at the time, 1,200 folks, you know, and all the resources we need. We had a surgeon, we had a lawyer, we had engineers, we had, you know, everything that we needed. Um, and it made sense for that mission. In the FBI, uh, you know, we often found ourselves, I always found myself traveling by myself generally uh, as what we call low profile. And so there's definitely unique challenges with that. You know, it's kind of the old African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Um, I would go with, you know, little to no infrastructure, uh, very little support. And um, uh, there was parts of that that I enjoyed, but then there were parts of that that, that brought um, just kind of that lack of um, uh, support that you can rest upon. So you'd have okay. to immediately get there, right, and find the local resources. I remember 
uh, working in West Africa at one point. As soon as I got there, I was looking for someone to, you know, uh, have as far as, uh, you know, linked arms. And so I found some Brits that had a compound there. And so got together with them and, and you know, made it all a little bit better. But it, like you said, to your point, a lot of isolation, um, not a lot of support in, in some of these places. It makes it very interesting, but the reality of it is there's a lot of lonely days, lonely nights um, in these non-permissive environments. Wow. So um, working alone in dangerous situations, obviously it takes its toll um, uh, on one's mental state. So how did you manage to cope and how did you manage to balance your career with that of your personal life and protecting your family? Well, I mean, I have to say up front, we all signed up for the job. You know, this is not a conscript occupation in the <laughs> FBI, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, you, you raise your hand. And, but the first week, you know, the instructors are making sure that you're seeing the reality of what you're walking into for 20, 25 years. So they show you a lot of videos of real life shootings. They usher you into the minds of the darkest people, you know, on the planet. Uh, so, you know, very early on, you know, I'm looking at years and years of being in dark parts of the world and people and potential violence. So, you know, that's that's coming. Right. Okay. Um, uh, you know, I remember uh, serving a search warrant with a small tactical team in Central Africa early on in my career. And it all kind of came together. There was the, you know, the darkness of people that wanted to harm you. Um, there were this, you know, kind of this austere uh, conditions that you're dealing with. Uh, you didn't know what was going to happen. A lot of complexities there. So, uh, but you knew that you were you were walking into that. And again, you didn't have a local police department like you do in the states to kind of fall back upon. You know, if you're yeah. if you're overwhelmed. So, um, so I think a lot of that is there. But you're, I think, as you start out with the right mindset, then you're prepared to go into it. But again, uh, kind of to your point, like when I worked uh, the child predators for five years you're involved in this darkness and, and things that are more disgusting than we can, you know, discuss here, disgusting. Yeah. Um, but then at the end of the day, you know, you've talked to this suspect for three or four hours, you get in your car and you drive home to some sort of sense of normalcy. So, okay. um, so I think for me, I use that drive time actually to decompress, to kind of uh, cleanse my mind as much as I could. Um, but I also have to point to my faith and my faithful spouse. Um, uh, you know, I've been together since the old days in the army. So I think that certainly helped along as well. Yeah, that's amazing. So having overseen some of the biggest and most com uh, complex investigations and had a diverse uh, career within the FBI, what would you say makes your leadership skills different from others? Um, and how do you keep such an incredible focus? Well, I offer nothing innovative. I'll say that right up front. I think what I, what I bring uh, to the fight is I've worked for some legendary leaders from my time as a young army officer uh, in, in different places where we were deployed um, uh, to this day. I mean, I remember growing up, you know, as a kid, unfortunately, my dad was an alcoholic till the day he died, but, but he was a warrior. He served, you know, our country for 40 years and three wars. Um, but he wasn't really a mentor for me. He was gone a lot. So, but after moving out, going to college, I met this young army captain, a guy named Steve Heinen, who leaned into me as a young man and taught me uh, how to be a leader. You know, so I think from that day through, you know, the machinations of, you know, the a couple different careers pushed together, uh, I've just worked for some great people. I will say though that um, there really is something to this term servant leadership. And so I really yeah. try to abide by that. Um, I, you know, I consider myself tough, but fair. Uh, I try to take care of people. Um, but I think Karen, what I've done is really preemptively, I've, I've learned one lesson and that's to hire the top performers with incredible integrity. Uh, yeah. And that just seems to quell issues down the road. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you are skilled in many languages, in particular Arabic. Um, did this talent lead you into uh, the study of Islam, or did you, or did your FBI role need uh, need the languages? And how did this help you at your time, or 
uh, in your time as an FBI agent? Yeah, well, my story of language skills is is uh, underwhelming. I can tell you that I took Spanish in high school and was probably the lowest student in my class. Wow. Um, my teacher would yell at me to to close the, the the window in the back of the room. I think that's the only phrase I picked up, you know, in Spanish. <laughs> um, I took French in college. I was mediocre at best, but. I think what happened to me was, um, I, you know, growing up in my household, my dad would travel to Saudi Arabia, work there and come back and tell these fascinating stories. So there was something when I started Arabic uh, that just clicked with me. And it, it okay. just, um, uh, I remember going to the first day of my first uh, class in Arabic. I think there was 20 of us. Um, and at the end of the day, everyone had a migraine. Everyone was like, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. For some strange reason, I was like, I love this. You know, we were conjugating verbs and um, it just, it, it spoke to me and uh, it worked for me. And so from there, uh, I just kind of took off, but, but it was a tool for me. It was a tool for me in investigations. It was a tool for me that I leveraged to get people to talk to me and, and yeah. to get to the truth, um, whether or not they were, you know, a true terrorist or not. Uh, so uh, honestly, it was it was a tool in my tool belt, and that's why I really ran down that road because I felt like this is going to help me. This is going to help in discernment, determining, uh, you know, how radical this person is and maybe what their trajectory towards action is. Yeah. No, uh, and that's amazing because it's not an easy language I wouldn't imagine to learn. Well, it's, um, you know, in the beginning, you're getting used to the right to left, you know, uh, script. You're getting used to the diacritic symbols above and below the letters. But the, the, the reality is uh, it's a phonetic language. So what you see, you say, and which is very unlike English when you're learning English. And so... Uh, once you kind of get the equation figured out, then it's just learning conjugation and new vocabulary. So, um, so again, nothing magical about me learning it, but it's something that I I I, I live I learned to love, yeah. and to this day I'm still you know using it whenever I can. Wow. So, ten tours in Africa must have given you some interesting insights into leadership of the continent. What do you see as the biggest influences on leaders in those countries uh, where you worked? Well, yeah, you know, I, I loved working in Africa. I spent most of my time there, you know, uh, time in the Middle East, of course, as well with the Arabic. Um, but uh, I think when I, when I first landed in uh, Kenya, uh, it was my first time in Africa and, and seeing the acacia trees I think for some reason I was drawn to a lot of time on the ground there. I just, uh, you know, I knew that I was going to be spent a lot of time there and I enjoyed that. Um, but uh, I knew nothing about the people, about governments. Uh, and of course, you'll never know that much about Africa with all the countries and the different cultures and things. Yeah. Um, what I learned, and, and especially when I'd go and teach over there, teach counterterrorism practices and things like that, was that uh, there was a lot of people that wanted to, uh, you know, do great things, but they were so limited in resources and technology yeah. and, and things like that. Okay. And I also learned that leadership, especially at the government level, depending on which country you're in, was replete with corruption, right? So yeah. uh, you had the, right, as you know, better than, than me, you have the haves and the have nots, and there's not much in the middle. So as I was working there, I was constantly trying to, um, you know, kind of maneuver through the jungle of the, you know, dynamics of how do we work with this country who wants to work together arm in arm to protect their, their country, even though they're living in almost a, a palatial, you know, estate. Um, and the people on the ground, you know, the commoners uh, want the same things, but they're two completely different strata. So, um, so I learned in each country it's different, um, but that corruption piece is threaded um, throughout yeah, the continent. Very much so. So that leads me to um, diamonds have been the cause of immense suffering for over centuries. Can you give us some insight of your time in Sierra Leone and the effects of blood diamond trade in the region? And has the De Beers monopoly managed to stabilize um, or aggravate the the global in, 
illicit um, diamond market situation uh, in the recent past? Yeah, Karen, I think my, my trip to Sierra Leone in 2006 was probably one of the most fascinating. Um, uh, a guy named Douglas Farah wrote a book yeah. about blood diamonds. Um, a congressman read it. He called his friend who was the ambassador in Freetown, Sierra Leone. Uh, and they called the FBI and the FBI said, we're going to send someone to open up an attache office in the embassy or the consulate at the time um, and lead this blood diamond investigation. So the Africa unit called me because I had some Arabic, which I can explain a little bit more about. I had a lot of experience with Al Qaeda, which, which is, you know, threaded into the blood diamonds yeah. allegations. And, um, so I was looking at the map, trying to figure out where Sierra Leone was. <laughs> and <laughs> next thing I know, I was on a, I was on a plane um, over there and uh, landed at Lungi Island, took a hydrofoil to the mainland. And that was kind of the beginning for me by myself wow. uh, and working there and, and trying to lead the investigation, open up the attache office. I learned so much about uh, the diamond industry, the processes, um, mm. the Kimberly process in particular, but at this point, um, you know, what I do know is I've been refreshed on all of this um, with a project in Africa about a year ago and, and saw that, um, you know, the corruption continues, uh, not from De Beers, but on the continent uh, with diamonds, as you probably know. Um, but a lot of things have changed. You know, COVID has greatly impacted, uh, you know, the diamond profits. Yeah. Um, they're slowly starting to come back here in the last quarter of the year. Mm. Um, but the other thing that's greatly impacting everything are these lab-grown diamonds. And so um, even De Beers has opened up their own front uh, with lab-grown diamonds. And wow. uh, uh, they are starting to produce those out of um, Oregon here in the U.S. And so what that's going to do, you know, the, the, the downside is that there's going to be less business in the minefields. But again, we're looking at, as I've seen, you know, the child labor in the mm -hmm. mud there, you know, sifting through for, for diamonds. Um, but what it is doing is it's, um, it's decreasing uh, the, the corruption uh, supply chain in essence. And so, I mean, even the, the statistics are showing that millennials in the U S uh, are buying up the lab-grown diamonds, which are pretty much flawless um, yeah. in in droves, and so that's taking over. And I think it's it's starting to um, drive down the corruption process um, of the 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 rough diamonds uh, coming out of Africa. So so yeah, it's all very interesting. Um, but you know, we know that uh, you know the corruption through the mines and the child labor continues to this day. Yeah, it's very scary and it's very sad. So, Absolutely. Um, you were deployed uh, internationally on different missions, um, and most of us will never fully understand some of the things you have seen. So can you share with us more about this, and what would you say have been some of the toughest, or some of your toughest mental challenges, and how did you keep your mental state of mind together during those times? Yeah, great question. Um, really scratching uh, the surface into, you know, some realities there. Yeah. Uh, and I appreciate that about your podcast. And, and I, I really appreciate, you know, the guests you've had, but you actually ask very interesting questions. And I do appreciate you putting the time and effort into that. Um, you know, it's easy to say, hey, I stayed focused on the mission at hand, right? I yeah. mean, I think that's the knee jerk uh, reaction, but there are almost insurmountable challenges in these spaces. I mean, yeah. um, a lot of isolation, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, I can tell you just as a vignette, you know, when I was in East Africa just a couple of years ago, um, I, was, I was really kind of stuck in my room um, for days. And, uh, um, you know, the, and you go through all this, you know, survival training, isolation training, captivity training, uh, in the military and in the intelligence community as part of um, pre-deployment um, operations activities. But what I was doing, because I was locked in, I couldn't go anywhere. It was dangerous where I was, um, and I can't roam around very easily, you know, unnoticed mm -hmm. in certain places. And so I, because I was so locked down, a couple things I did. One is you've got to, you know, start a routine, right? And you have to try to stay 
you know, keep some sense of fitness, even if you're kind of imprisoned in your room. I started unpacking and repacking my suitcase over and over again and, wow. and write down how long it took me, right? Uh, just to have something to keep my mind somewhat mentally fit, you know, through days and days at a time. Yeah. Um, and then in regards to general fitness, like I started a, a fitness routine using the furniture in the room, you know, just, just to be doing something. And so um, you've got to have some routine. You've got to try to stay fit. You have to try to eat healthy, which is so difficult, right? When you're when you're on those trips and these austere locations. So, um, so again, it's easy to say, ah, just stay focused on the mission at hand. But you've got to implement real tangibles while you're there to to kind of keep your head clear along the way. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's very easy. I mean, for you to also feel like you want to climb the walls. Because I mean, just with COVID, and this is just probably a very light version for the majority of people but when you are feeling so isolated there are times where you actually feel like you want to climb the walls <laughs> so well no and then to your point karen i've talked to a number of uh folks you know former military that say COVID is a lot like being on deployment you know a yeah. guy i talked to not long ago said yeah i remember when i was deployed to somalia years ago he said that's what COVID feels like like it can't go anywhere you know, you, you've got so many limitations and restrictions. So yeah, I think you nailed it yeah. right on the head there. So having your own agency, um, what would you say um, you do differently and do better from the lessons you have learned from your time um, in the service uh, of the FBI? Well, um, uh, I, you know, I love our company, Red Rock Global Security Group. We have an amazing team. Um, and, um, you know, we do global investigations. We do due diligence for companies that are getting ready to partner with other entities. The machine works. Like I, you know, when we get projects in, like it works. It's, it's done well. The report's written well. We, we, we do great with clients. But I think one of the things I learned early on in the FBI, especially in regards to interviewing is is really trying to get to uh, the critical node of the individual that you're talking to right yeah, yeah. finding out what's important to them right so even if, you know whether you're talking to uh, someone who's kidnapped somebody or someone who robbed a bank or whatever it may be um, in order to get a confession you have to figure out what's important to that individual yeah. is it his, his daughter true. is it his aunt, is it his wife, is it a cousin, you know, whatever it is. And so that's something I learned early on. And, I, and I'll tell you up front, I'm an introvert by nature. I went into the FBI as an introvert. I'm an introvert to this day. Yeah. I went there not knowing how to interview people, but I was, I was dead set on learning how to do it. So yeah. I followed people and I took notes and I learned to do it. And I started finding success. But part of that is learning uh, what's important. So I've taken that lesson of finding out what's important into the business world. So, you know, we'll get, we'll get a, you know, an email from someone saying, Hey, we'd like to hire you guys. Um, we do a zoom call and we sit there and spend a lot of time totally trying to understand exactly what they're looking for. Right. Because it's easy to sell people things they don't need. Right. And yeah, so of course. we, right. We try to stay completely away from that because in the end, if I give you something you don't need, you know, it's a waste of your money, your time, our time. And so that's something that I brought forward into, into the, the business world. Yeah, for sure. So um, what have been some of your biggest career highlights? Um, and what would you say um, have been some of your biggest lessons and, lessons and learnings uh, within your career? Well, I'll start with, um, you know, biggest lesson in learnings. I'll just say I'm a lifelong learner. I've learned, you know, yes. even to this day of spending so many years in the counterterrorism world, I still realize I know very little. So I want to learn more every day, you know, but as far as career highlights, you know, I, I spent the majority of my career, unlike a lot of FBI agents, um, everyone kind of finds their place in their niche. Yeah. Um, you know, I hunted and investigated Al Qaeda and ISIS for most of my career. I loved every minute of it. That's all I wanted to do. I, I thought it was fun working the criminal matters like we talked about early on in Los Angeles and all that. But once I got a taste of, of 
you know, uh, working the jihadist realm. Like I never wanted to go back. That's all I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I would say overall on the macro level, you know, I would say, you know, that was a, a, just a really kind of a lifelong career highlight. Um, in the weeds a little bit, I was, I had the, you know, privilege of interviewing uh, probably about 600 radical jihadists along the way. I got to spend wow. so many hours in that a room. must have been so interesting from a psychological standpoint. It is. It's that uh, confluence of, you know, the psychology, the, you know, just the behavioral assessment, uh, someone who wants to harm others, someone yeah. who looks at you as someone who's outside of their, you know, circle of microtheology, doesn't even yeah. want to breathe the air that you breathe, you know. And so, but in the end, I'm trying to get information from them. I'm trying to get them to relax, relax their shoulders, tell me what's on their mind, tell me their intentions, all these things. And in the, in the beginning, they don't want to do that. So you've got to whittle away and kind of get them to the point where they're just very relaxed and mm. they're calling you Brig and, you know, you're walking down a road Socratically to figure out, you know, uh, where they're going with all of this. But, you know, I'd say that was, you know, something that would, would be really kind of a highlight is spending all that time with, with these folks. Um, and I think on the other end is just being able to teach to a lot of folks all these things from all these things I've learned and mistakes that I've made um, to cops, to military folks, uh, to civilian, you know, people on pre-attack indicators, how to run informants, how to disrupt jihadist cells. So, you know, I had the privilege of teaching at least 10, 12,000 people, you know, on, on all of this. So that, to me, again, that's a highlight to be able to kind of carry it forward to others. Yeah, absolutely. So COVID-19 has turned our worlds upside down and inside out. So how and what have you done um, to adapt? And can you give us some examples? Yeah, so unfortunately, um, for so many with COVID, I know so many have lost jobs, so many companies have lost revenue. Um, it's just been, you know, just shattered their existence. Um, a lot of what we do has, has not missed a beat. You know, we've, we've been able to continue on bringing high quality, uh, you know, product and performance to, to clients. Um, you know, we've shifted, to, of course, to the online meetings, some in person if we need to. Um, but for us, I think that, you know, if there's one thing that, that we've done that we kind of figured out, kind of stumbled into is we've leveraged our network. So, okay. you know, if, if a client comes to us and they say, we have a need in China, right? So, you know, maybe before one of us would get on a plane and go right mm -hmm. now, what we've done uh, kind of through forcing function is we've really built out our network all over the world. So, you know, if, if we need something in South Africa, you know, I've got a guy there that I yeah. trust that we have vetted. I can call him. Uh, you know, we know how we're going to communicate, whether it's a encrypted platform, whatever it may be. Um, I know what his capabilities are, his credentials. I know what his, um, what his boundaries are. And so I think if there's anything that I've learned and that we've adapted to is we've, we've learned to leverage our network really around the world. Yeah, that's amazing. So when you retired from the FBI and went on your own, what was that transition like? And then going from a highly, in, uh, a highly intense, very uh, secretive, razor focused position um, and always being alert, um, what was the process in terms of decompression and adapting to the new role within your business? Um, and um, how did your years of experience add value to your own business? Well, the truth is, Karen, I'm trying to figure it out. I, I don't have any, yeah. I don't have any secret code, right? Yeah. I'm, and I think my, you know, coming from my realm, um, you know, you kind of, you, everyone lies to you. Good guys, bad guys, informants, everyone lies to you. So mm -hmm. you don't trust people, right? Yeah. And so when I retired, you know, I'm talking to my wife and I'm, I'm going, I need to start trusting people, you know? Yeah, because um, that's hard. It is, it is, especially when yeah. everywhere you go, and again, even the good people are lying to you or they're keeping information from you, you know, omitting information. Um, it, it, you know, you just kind of reach this state, right? And so, so I, you know, I kind of in the beginning thought after a time, okay, I'm going to start just trying to trust everybody. 
And then I ran head in head on into a wall. And, um, you know, even with some peers, uh, you know, learn that not everyone is still honest and, you know, people are going to defraud me, you know? And so, Mm -hmm. so I've had to tighten up the aperture again. I'm still working on it. I'm saying, I don't have it figured out. I know that, you know, our company, the machine works. um, But even to this day, we are still questioning who we are going to work with. Even clients, we're very cautious who we hitch our trailer to. Um, yes. But we're hired to we're hired to question everything. So um, that's a good thing, uh, you know, when you're doing global investigations, due diligence, and training, things like that. Um, but it's still learning to figure out who we can trust along the way. So I'm yeah, still working on it every day. Yeah, absolutely. So you um, are also sought after as a speaker specializing in security and terrorism. Has this exposure come? from your involvement um, with Red Rock Global, um, and what strategy have you used to develop this aspect of your career? Well, um, you know, I, again, what I, what I learned about myself, as I mentioned before, is I'm an introvert. Maybe I'll say I'm a situational extrovert, um, and, you know, I've learned how to interview folks um, in, in, in a strange way. I, I have this kind of an innate uh, ability to be a chameleon. So I can shift as I need to. Uh, that's one thing I found with teaching is as an introvert, you really don't want to stand in front of a class, right? No. But I found, <laughs> right? Yeah. But I found that that's something that, that really came easy for me. So I found that's a place I've really thrived. I love to do it. I love to, um, I challenge myself to get better and better at it. And, 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 and I even, you know, tell classes, is there anything I'm off on? Is there something else I need to work on because I want to improve myself in this area? So uh, again, lifelong learner, but I love I love teaching is, is definitely part of it. Amazing. So that leads me to the last two questions. Uh, what are the three key pieces of advice um, you would give to others looking to pursue a career in your line of work? Um, and what legacy would you like to leave or how would you like to be remembered? Well, you know, I saw someone with a shirt the other day, had a a beautiful quote, and it said, no one cares, comma, work harder. And I thought that was so perfect. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, I'm I'm not a big fan of whiners, right? I was never uh, allowed to be a whiner as a child. You know, push, push forward. And as an investigator, if you're looking to get into this field as an investigator, um, you've got to push forward, you got to push harder. You got to learn more. You have to be relentless, right? And and as a supervisor, I always wanted those agents because I would rather have someone that I have to rein in than I have to push forward, right? And, and it's yeah. the whole thing of the string on the table. You can't push that string, you know? Yeah. And so uh, so it's always, you know, if you're going to get into this this realm, uh, you, you uh, that relentless bulldog is is really the epitome of the investigator, and ask yourself, is that me, right? I think yeah. the, second, the second piece of this is, in the FBI in particular, you will see darkness like you've never seen in your life. You will see violence. You will see the ugliest parts of life possible. Yeah. And so there's dead bodies, there's blood, there's very disturbed people. And so you're not only going to investigate them, um, but you're going to sit with them in a room by yourself for hours. Is wow. that something... Yeah. Um, that 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 you want to do, you know, yeah. that's something. Are you going to be comfortable doing? And I think the third thing I'd say is you got to be a team player. You know, this law enforcement is a team, you know, exercise. You're all in it together. You got forensic folks. You got interrogators. You've got, you know, everyone, uh, you know, has a different role. It's not a sole practitioner thing. So no. um, if you're someone that stares at your shoes and doesn't want to be around other people, this is not the right fit for you. Yeah. Um, as far as legacy, you know, I, I would I would hope that I'd be remembered as someone who served his life both to his family and to his country. And, yeah. and you know, I, I never sought to make money. Uh, if I did, I, I'd made a lot of wrong life char- choices along the way. But yeah. I, you know, I've always wanted to serve others. You know, I think um, I, I always wanted I would always want to be remembered as someone who stopped and helped others. You know, on the side of the road or whatever. But I think with that, you know, I spent a lot of time in the interview room with people who made big mistakes in their life. And we all make mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes in life, even before I came in the FBI. Um, But 
uh, you know, you know, I think I spent a lot of time talking to people about, uh, you know, the mistakes that they've made, but I all saw them as real people. And I never yeah. want to lose that. I always want to yeah. see people like that. Life will beat you down, right? We all, we, we eventually will see that in our life. And so uh, I think I've always tried to recognize that in people. Well, that is amazing. Thank you so much, Greg, for your time and for sharing your story. And hopefully we can have you back in the future uh, to see where you are in your journey. And um, if people would like to connect with you, what are the best platforms to do so? Yeah, Karen, um, uh, our website is redrockgsg.com. So that's an easy way. Uh, and certainly reach directly out to me. You know, marketing at redrockgsg um, is the best way to connect. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Brick, for your time, and um, we'll have you back in the future for sure. Great. Thanks for having me, Karen. You've got a great podcast, and uh, I, I love listening to the different episodes. Thank you so much.